Hi, this is Justin Colletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today I want to give you one quick tip that is going to change the way you use EQ forever for the better, I think. Bold claim. Is it true? You tell me in the comments down below. You've got to try this out. It was a big change for me when I started doing it, and I think tremendously helpful. And I think it's going to be useful to you as well. Before I get into it, the briefest of shout outs to our sponsors. Our biggest sponsor is you. You sponsor by smashing the like button if you're on the Facebook or the YouTube version of this, making sure you're subscribed up, hit notifications, bells, all that good stuff. Or if you're on one of the audio only versions like Spotify, like Apple Podcasts, make sure you subscribe there and consider giving us a rating and review. It really does help. Also, big shout out to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative effects in the known universe, sponsoring this podcast since the very beginning. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at SoundToys.com. Can't say enough good stuff about them in the mixing context. Talking about mixing, let's get into today's one big tip for how to use your EQ differently than you may already be using it. One piece of advice that you may hear a lot when it comes to using EQ is, number one most common piece of advice, don't use too much EQ. Don't do big boosts and cuts. Sometimes that's good advice. Sometimes it's good to you know turn the knob around until it breaks off. The other piece of advice you might get quite a bit is sweep your EQs. Do a big boost and listen for how it changes when you sweep back and forth. And when you get to a point where it sounds really annoying, cut that out. And I think that this can actually be a good exercise if you're new, but it's not what I recommend. If you are new to mixing, I think it's a great ear training exercise to do that. But I also think it's dangerous, and I often advise people against relying on that technique too much. One reason is you're probably not in an ideal mixing environment if you're relatively new to mixing. And when you get to a really annoying spot that sounds terrible on that big, narrow boost, that might not actually be a problem in the mix. It might be a problem in your room. It's actually probably more likely a problem in your room. Your room may have way too much 80 hertz or way too much 300 hertz. And when you get there, you say, that sounds awful, but it's like a resonant point in your room and you're sucking it out and you're not improving the mix. You're compensating for issues in your room. Or you have a weird uh, flutter echo, a lot of it, you know, 8K and up, and you do all these weird cuts up there because of it. So that's something that can happen. And I also think it kind of makes you listen out of context a little bit. Like, Everything kind of sounds a little bad when you boost it really, really loud with a really, really narrow bandwidth. Like that's just a kind of sucky sounding thing and you can end up making cuts that you don't need to make. I have found that once you've trained your ear, and this could be a good way to train your ear, but once you have, a better way to EQ is to just pick a frequency that you think might be the offending frequency and then boost or cut it by the amount you think it should be boost or cut by. And then see if it sounds better. Now, you might say, that's all well and good, but I'm so new to mixing, how would I know what frequency range it is that I should be starting at? And fair enough. This is not a technique for someone who has been doing this for one month. It's probably not a technique for someone who's been doing it for three months or for six months. But once you feel like you've done sufficient ear training that you can at least identify the correct broad frequency range, like you're like, I know the problem is in the low end, or I know it's in the mid range, or I know it's in the high frequencies, then just just try boosting or cutting one of those areas to see if you're right. Better yet, if you can zero in further, I think each of those areas separates into your low end will separate into your subs. That means things I would say generally below 80 or below 60 hertz and your upper base, things generally between 100 and 200 hertz. You want to do some listening exercises so you can differentiate between those two areas in the lows. Then you have your low mid range and your high mid range and your low mid range might be mm, two or 300, 200, 300 hertz all the way up to uh, Five, six hundred hertz. And then you have your upper mid range, which might be, you know, one and a half, two K all the way up to six or seven K. And then you have your high frequencies. And in your high frequencies, you can divide those into two areas. Maybe your low highs, which might be like 
7K to like 9K or something, and your high highs are like 10K to 20K. And once you can start distinguishing those areas, then you're starting to get really ready for this. And that's not a big ask. So a very small ask for you here is to start being able to identify those areas. And sweeping EQs can help with that. Using a ear training app, like our friends at the Pro Audio Files have one called Quiz Tones. That's a good one. Another good strategy is when you're doing your EQing, use a frequency analyzer. Like uh, what might come with uh, an isotope EQ or a fab filter EQ. Using that kind of frequency analyzer to create a little bit of an ear-eye memory for what these different areas sound like. But once you feel like you can start differentiating those things, it's pretty easy to say there's a problem in the low frequencies. Is it the subs or is it the upper bass? And you really start to develop a sense memory for what subs feel like and sound like and what the upper bass feels like and sounds like. And you can help this by looking at a frequency analyzer and then just make your best case. Well, I'm going to need to boost the subs on this one. So... I don't know. The subs are like from 0 hertz to maybe 80 hertz. Let's try 50 and boost there and see if it's better or worse. Let's try 60 and boost there, see if it's better or worse. Let's cut there. Maybe you're on a system where you can't hear those subs very well, and that's possible. So maybe I shouldn't have led with that example. But you can take the same idea to your high frequencies. You know there's a problem in the high frequencies. You need to cut something. You're not sure if it's the high highs, maybe that's 10K and up, or the lower highs, maybe that's 6, 7K to 10K, something like that. So you try doing a cut above 10K, and you try doing a cut maybe centered on 7 or 8K. And again, you can assist yourself in this by looking at a frequency analyzer. And rather than just sweeping, first, identify the problem. What are you trying to do? And this is another reason I don't love sweeping, because it makes things random. I guess I should EQ this track. Let's sweep through and see what I should be EQing on it. Oh, there's something that sounds bad. I guess I'll EQ it. No. Listen to the track. Before you touch a single knob, say to yourself, does this track need anything? If so, what? Is it too bright? Is it too dark? Is it too mid-rangey? Is it not mid-rangey enough? And then once you've made that decision, try to be a little bit more specific. Ah, it's too bright. That means I think I want to get rid of some high frequencies. Do I want to get rid of, is it high frequencies or upper mids? Let me try the upper mids. Let me try the highs. Oh, it's the highs. Is it the highs between 10K and 20K? Or is it the highs between 7K and 10K? And then try each of those areas. And once you've gone through this approach, this thought process, this idea about mixing enough times, you'll just find yourself doing it naturally. You'll just kind of zero in and be like, oh, that track has too much 8K. (laughs) Let's go for 8K. You might not think about it in numbers because there's a lot of good mixing engineers who don't know their frequencies. And I've talked to some of them. They don't know their frequencies, but they know ranges. Oh, yeah, that's the highs. And there's an old school analog guy or gal might be like, and for that high, when I hear like those highs, that problem, I like to use this EQ. And I like to use its high frequency knob and they like it because it's targeting that area. So they've maybe haven't even internalized the numbers. They have a different way of getting there, but they're still doing that same thing. They're first evaluating the problem. Second, kind of thinking even more deeply about where the problem is. And then third, using a tool or approach that they know fixes that area. So I hope that's useful for you. This is me encouraging you to do A, a little bit of ear training. B, evaluate sounds instead of just EQing them blindly and assuming they need EQ, like deciding what they need first before you EQ them. And then third, just make your best guess. I think this probably has too much 8K. I'm confirming it by looking at a frequency analyzer, maybe in the beginning or even later on. I use them in in mastering just to double check myself. Oh, I think there's a problem up there where eh, it's probably between 8K and 10K. And then I look at the analyzer and it's like, oh, it's 8.5K. I'll just go right there, you know? 
It's like I heard something sticking out in that area and I can see on the chart there actually is something sticking out in that area. So sometimes the analyzers can help reinforce something you've already determined by listening. And that's what I think the best thing uh, is for them. And then the third thing that I'm encouraging you to do, which is really the big number one tip, is to stop sweeping and just go ahead and make a decision. Cut that 8K by 3 dB and say, well, it seems like that was the right area, but that was too much of a cut. Maybe it only needs a dB and a half cut. Oh, that sounds a lot better. What about if it was only a half dB cut? Mm, that's not enough. Let's go back to a dB. Oh, that's good. You know, it was better close to a dB and a half. Let's do a dB and a quarter. Okay, now that I'm assessing over a quarter dB, I'm probably done. <laughs> and that is how these things go when you get down into it and you've done it again and again and again. Well, I hope this is useful for you. I told you it was one big tip, and it is, but there's kind of like three subsets into it, and they're all important, and I hope this one is useful for you. If it is, let me know in the comments down below. You can always email me at podcast at sonicscoop.com. If you prefer to email, I read all the emails there. You can also comment on YouTube and uh, the Facebooks and all that. Big shout out and thanks to you for checking this out. If you want to go deeper with me, I've got two full-length courses, Mixing Breakthroughs and Mastering Demystified. I think they're the most useful things I've ever done in my entire life, so definitely check those out if you're into going super deep. If you want to go super deep, but you prefer the price tag of $0, I got a few free workshops for you. You can check out sonicscoop.com slash mix habits for the five habits of every great mixer and literally every great mixer I've talked to, studied, worked alongside, seen work, interviewed. All of them do all five of these things, or all of them do at least four, but almost all of them do five. So check that out, sonicscoop.com slash mix habits for those five habits of every great mixer. If you prefer to go deeper in mastering, you can get the free workshop mastering 101 at sonicscoop.com slash mastering 101. Hope those are useful for you. Another thing that's going to be useful for you is our sponsors for this week, Sound Toys, sponsoring this podcast since the beginning, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Check them out at soundtoys.com where you can try out anything they make for free for 30 days at soundtoys.com. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for hanging out with me. See you next time.